Welcome to our channel. We are so glad that you stopped in. If you would like to connect with us, go to clifec.com slash connect. We are so expectant that God is going to move through this message. Please enjoy it. Seat. We want to be sure to welcome those who are joining us online. Uh, I know we've got people that join us uh, locally, uh, folks from the Kaufman County Detention Center, uh, folks that are just at home because of a myriad of different reasons, and then people in other states and other countries around the world. So uh, those of us in the room, can we just give it up for those that are joining us online? We want to be sure that you feel welcome. We're grateful to have you as a part of our services today. Uh, so I wanted to start by asking this question. Have any of you heard of, this has been going on for years, uh, but like jelly beans that they have a myriad of different flavors, right? Like lots of, like the disgusting ones. Have any of you ever seen these? Uh, somebody one time was eating some of these and they put one in their mouth and they went, ah, this is disgusting. Tastes like vomit. And then, yeah, so they have jelly. If y'all didn't know this, you need to know this because somebody could trick you with it. And then the person had the audacity to look at me and go, you want to try it? <laughs> and I'm like, what kind of freak would I need to be to see your expression and to hear you actually say it tastes like vomit and then for me to go, sure, I'd love to try one. Like, I know I'm overweight, but come on, everybody's got their limits, right? There's just something about um, kind of being warned about something. And that's what this series has been about. Uh, the Israelites, the children of God, uh, just generation after generation would rebel against God and uh, they, they would go against what it was that he told them to do. They went off the rails, so to speak. And um, we felt like if we would spend some time looking at their story, that it would kind of be one of those moments where as uh, the people of God, we would go, I, I, I don't want to do what they did. I, I don't want to try what they tried. I, I don't want to go in the direction uh, that they went in. And so uh, what we know, however, uh, is that so often we do find ourselves kind of off the rails in terms of the way we're living out our faith or not living out our faith. Uh, and sometimes we get to a place, if we're just going to be willing to be honest about it, uh, where we wonder, have we gone too far? Uh, have we disappointed God so deeply that he's cutting ties with us. And so uh, for some of you, whenever you first came in, if today's your first week here, or maybe this series is your first exposure to sea life, uh, maybe you've been coming for years and years and years. And then whenever we rolled out all these banners and had your coffee cup saying, never too far gone, never too far gone, it's on the ceiling. Uh, we got photo ops for it. We got stuff all over the place saying never too far gone. Um, today's message really is for the person, and maybe there's multiple people, but I, I would guess with this many people in the room and those joining us, uh, online. This message is really for the person who goes, all that sounds really nice and clean and tidy, uh, but you don't know my story. You don't know how screwed up my life is. You don't know how deep my addiction is. And uh, Randy, you don't know, like you don't know. It sounds nice to say never too far gone, but uh, all the people in my sphere of influence have built up all sorts of barriers and uh, they've kind of pushed me away and they're like, you're just a failure. You're always going to keep coming back to this addiction. And uh, and you just feel like you've hit absolute rock bottom. And, and today, uh, we just, we just want to close out this series with um, a little bit of a defense on why we believe that it's true that you're never too far gone. And, and there may be some people in your life that have put up some boundaries. Uh, there may be some people in your life that have asked you to move out. There may be some people in your life that aren't giving you money anymore. There may be, a, like you may have a spouse. I'm, I'm talking today to the person who's dealing with an addiction. I'm talking to the person today who's having an extramarital affair. I'm talking to the person today who is a jerk to everybody in your world, and you wonder why you don't have any friends and why people don't want to spend any time with you. And in your mind, it's all their fault, but it's not really their fault. You're a jerk, and they don't want to hang out with you. Like you're a terrible person to be around, and... And like, you know that sort of under the surface, but this, this facade is that it's everybody else's problem. I'm talking to the person who feels really lonely and isolated because of a sin issue, whatever it is. Like I'm talking to the person who is going, you know what? I just feel like my life has kind of been off the rails and I'm not sure that it can ever be put back on the rails. I'm also talking to the person who has someone in your life that you're worried about and you're worried, what, is it possible for them to get to the place where even God says, I don't have any more grace for you. I don't have any more mercy for you. I'm, I'm moving uh, away from you. And so Israel is a perfect case study, we feel like, 
uh, on this question because throughout the Old Testament, the Israelites, the children of God, uh, they rebelled against God. They, they would push back against him. And they got caught in this, this cycle. We introduced this in week one, but they would disobey. And then their disobedience would lead to destruction. Uh, whenever they realized the consequence of their disobedience, they would cry out to God and be like, oh God, I'm so sorry. Would you please help us? And God, because he's a merciful God, would say, yes, I, I will help you. And, and he would deliver them out of whatever that destruction was. And then give it a little bit of time and, and they would just start the cycle over again. They would disobey and that disobedience would lead to destruction and they would cry out an apology and repentance and God would come in and deliver them and then they would just disobey again. And this was an era, uh, what we've been looking at over these past weeks is an era in Israel's history where they were uh, ruled by judges. And at the end of this era where they were ruled by judges, because if you were here in the first week, uh, you may remember we talked about how God initially uh, established a theocracy. God was going to be their king. Um, and they said, no, we don't want that. We want judges. So there were these judges um, and they didn't want to have a man sitting on the throne. Uh, they, they wanted these judges to rule them. Um, but eventually the people demanded that the prophet Samuel give them a king. They wanted a physical human to sit on a throne to lead them. Uh, and God told Samuel to tell them, you don't want that. This is in 1 Samuel 8, 10 through 18. I'm just going to kind of paraphrase. Uh, but the text, what it says is you're not going to like. God said, you're not going to like having a king because uh, a king is going to sit on his throne and he's going to take your sons and he's going to put them in his military. And the ones that aren't in his military are going to become his servants. And the king that you're asking for is going to take your daughters and he's going to force them into his service and he's going to take your fields and he's going to give you taxes and um, he's, he's going to do all of these things and you are not going to want a king. And what did the people say? The people said, we don't care. Give us a king. Now, uh, already there's probably somebody in here going, okay, this feels like super long, like a lot of Old Testament stuff. This is history. When are we going to talk about me? Okay, well, here's how we can talk about us because we love talking about us, right? Um, this is the equivalent, I believe, to the modern day. I know what God says, but I, I know what the scripture says. Like I, 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 get, I, I can tell you what it says about this decision that I'm about to make, this direction that I'm going, um, but... And then we fill in the blank with something that gives us some sort of justification to be, a dis to be disobedient to God. This happens all the time. Uh, I was talking to somebody, just a, a couple of people over the last couple of weeks, and it, it came out of their mouth. It's like, I know what the scripture says about this decision, but I just really feel in my heart that God has given me a peace about, and then fill in the blank. And so my retort, in a very pastoral way, of course, was, well, I'm sorry you feel that way, but this peace that you feel like you have that runs in direct opposition to the word of God is not a peace, it's an illusion. And this illusion is being given to you by the enemy because the enemy wants to derail you. The enemy wants you to hit rock bottom. Like, you just need to know the enemy is not out for your best interest. And so anything that runs contrary to the word and the will of God, God will not give you a peace about it. Let everyone who has ears hear that. And so it's it's... Like there is a tie-in, a modern day tie-in. That's essentially what these people were saying. God was being very clear with them. You don't want a king. And here are the reasons why you don't want a king. And they're like, well, we heard all that, but. And they demanded a king. So the people officially voted God off the throne. He allowed that. Uh, and the judges then uh, moved out of the picture and Samuel went and anointed Israel's first king who was Saul. Uh, things were fine for a minute, but Saul was really insecure. Uh, and so things went off the rail, it led to his disobedience of God. Um, and then after King Saul, after he had self-destructed, uh, then David ascended to the throne and David has gone down in history as Israel's greatest king. Uh, but in his humanity, even though there was a lot of good that came from David's reign, uh, he still had his problems. And, and we won't go through all of them, but if you're not familiar with King David, uh, just one that I would highlight. Uh, even though he was held as Israel's greatest king, he also took a man's wife, got her pregnant, uh, and then had the 
husband killed so that maybe he could get by with it. He did not come to a point of confession. He was caught. And another thing I want everybody to hear is confessing is way better than getting caught. So if you're living in a sin cycle right now that you think you got hidden from everybody, first of all, it's not hidden from God and all the people that are being impacted by your sinful choice, even though you don't see it happening in real time, they are being affected and it's way better for you to confess than it is to get caught. Let's just say that with some clarity. But he didn't confess it. Instead, God sent word through prophet Nathan who called him to account. Uh, he came to a place of repentance over that. Uh, but that's, that's King David. Like, so there's some humanity involved there, right? And, and so we can see that, that there, was, there were even problems there. So after David, David's son Solomon took over as king of Israel. Solomon started off great. God told Solomon, he's like, hey, what do you want? Tell me what you want. I'll give you whatever. Like, and, and so Solomon said, uh, he didn't say what I would say, which is I want three more wants. You know, I, I wasn't like that. He said, I want wisdom. And so God gave him wisdom and he did. He had supernatural wisdom. Uh, one case in particular where this wisdom was on full display, there were two women fighting over a baby. Who does the baby belong to? And Solomon said, I'll tell you what, let's just cut the baby in half and each of you can keep a half. Sounds like a terrible idea at first, right? So there's one lady said, fine. And the other lady says, no, don't do that. Don't do that. I would rather the baby live. And so Solomon said, that's the true mother of the baby. This is one of those moments. Like, it's like that, that was really good, which by the way is really good. He got that one right, or that would have been a blemish on his wisdom record, right? So, uh, but Solomon had an Achilles heel as well. And his Achilles heel was women. Uh, if you read first Kings 11, one through eight, there's a lot there, but, um, by the end of his life, he had 300 wives. Mercy. Uh, that's not an insult to ladies. I'm just, that's, that's, that's a lot. 300 wives and 700 concubines. Most of which, and this is important to note, were um, women who worshiped pagan gods. And God had been very clear about who should marry who and who should worship who and all that kind of stuff. And uh, Solomon had his own issues. When Solomon died, his son Rehoboam took to the throne. Uh, Re Rehoboam was a terrible, godless leader. Um, there was really nothing redemptive about that. The, the country immediately uh, kind of split and, and 10 of the tribes uh, turned against, uh, 10 of the northern tribes seceded from uh, the nation at that point and made Jeroboam their king. Jeroboam, I know a lot of words, a lot of names, you know, don't get lost in the weeds here. Um, but he was an advisor to Solomon and um, Israel split into two kingdoms, never to be reunited again. So there was this northern kingdom of Israel, also sometimes referred to as Ephraim. Um, and only the tribe of Judah and Benjamin stayed with Rehoboam, the southern kingdom. Here's why this is important. I know some of you are like, this is a history lesson. Make us laugh. Let us leave. I know. <laughs> Just hold tight, okay? Um, the northern kingdom, Israel, from the time of Jeroboam until they were conquered by Assyria in 722 B.C., had 19 kings, and this is what's important, not a single one of them obeyed the Lord. I, I did some research on this and, and like how these different kings were described. And kings of Israel, Jeroboam I, rebellious, uh, Nadab, bad, Basha, wicked, Elah, evil, Zimri, sinful, Tibni, iniquitous, uh, Omri, extra bad. I don't even know what that means. Uh, Ahab, the worst to that point. Um, ah Ahaziah, disobedient, Joram, mostly rotten, Jehu, not good, but better than the rest, <laughs> which I don't need, that's not a compliment, right? I was, I remember one time I was in New York city and I walked by one of these little restaurants and it said good burger. And I thought, that's not compelling. Like it's not bad. It's not great. It's just good. It's better than some worse than others. That's kind of the way this feels, right? Uh, somebody else was noncompliant, wayward, badly behaved, abysmal, full of vice, idolatrous, awful, uh, appalling. That, 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 that's how the kings of the northern uh, nation uh, of Israel, like that, that's how they were described in history. The kings of Judah weren't much better. This is the southern kingdom. Rehoboam, mostly bad. Uh, another one was mostly perverted. Uh, one of them was labeled as good. Um, Jehoshaphat was labeled as righteous, but uh, Joram was terrible. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. One was called devilish, uh, heinous, and, and uh, there were only a couple that were deemed as reputable and good. And here's what happened. If the, this is why it's important. If the king loved God and followed God, the people would follow the king in their worship of the one true God. And so it mattered about these kings. And God had told them, you're not 
going to like having a king. And they're like, but we want one. I know what you said, but I think we can find ourselves uh, in that. And so um, this just continued on over and over, generation after generation. Uh, the northern kingdom, it was all downhill. For the southern kingdom, it was up and down, more up than down. Uh, Judah followed the same cycle. You know, it was the same cycle of disobeying and then finding destruction, crying out, God delivers. And then for a while they were doing good, but then there would be this disobedience and it would lead to destruction and then they would cry out and God would deliver. Um, and God would send a king or a prophet every once in a while to turn the hearts of the people back to God and they would do that. Um, but eventually they, that king or that prophet would die and the people would go back to living in disobedience. And so uh, near the end of the Old Testament, when both Israel and Judah were walking in extended periods of the rejection of God, God took a little bit of a different approach. And uh, he did send a prophet. Um, his name was Hosea. Uh, but usually the way God would send prophets is he would send a word through the prophet to deliver to the people, right? Uh, but with Hosea, he told him, your life is going to be the message that I send to the people. This is important for us. If you've gotten lost in the history, welcome back. Getting ready to start talking a little more about us. And here's what God told Hosea. He's like, your life is gonna be the message and here's what I want you to do. He said, go and take for yourself an adulterous woman. <clears throat> Let's stop right there. I don't know how many of you parents have had the talk with your kids. I don't know how many of you have kids that are at the, I'm probably going to get married soon age. But my guess is there's not a single one of us who have looked at our kids and said this, I've received word from the Lord that you need to find yourself an adulterous woman. <laughs> we haven't done that, have we? If you have, we need to talk. <laughs> and then he said, your marriage with her is gonna be a picture of my relationship with my people. Now, this is important because God has used all throughout this scripture, the, the metaphor of marriage to describe his relationship with his people. In the New Testament, uh, Jesus is referred to as the bridegroom, the church, the bride of Christ, Jesus, uh, called the moment uh, when we get to heaven, the great marriage banquet. We see in Isaiah 54, five, for your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. So all throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see it over and over that God likens our relationship with him to a marriage covenant, which means this, anytime those of us who are in Christ in a relationship with God through salvation, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, anytime we turn our heart's affection to something else, whenever we put something else on the throne, whether it be even noble things like our, our spouse or um, our kids, man, there's a lot of kid worship that happens in our culture. Maybe it's your career and you're like, I'm just trying to provide for my family, but yet it slipped into something that's not providing for your family necessarily. They have monetary things, but, but they, don't, they don't have you. And, and so the job has become the thing. And, and when God sees that in our lives, wh whatever it is, whether it's a spouse or a kid or a job or money or a hobby, whatever, he often refers to that shift in allegiance as adultery, that he says, you're committing adultery because I have given you salvation, I've won your heart, like you're supposed to give, like you're, I'm supposed to have your heart. And so we see this happening uh, all throughout the scripture. He says, I, my relationship with you is like a marriage covenant. And here's something important for us to take away from the message today. God refuses to share his bride. He doesn't wanna share you. He doesn't wanna share me with anything else. So God tells Hosea to marry an adulterous woman and his marriage is gonna be a visual of God's relationship. And if you're Hosea, are you going, well, thanks, I'm glad to play a part. Hosea marries a woman named Gomer. <laughs> Every time I read this, I, this story, I just wanna go, golly. I mean, I just, <laughs> young people have no idea what I'm talking about. Gomer Pyle, so. Uh, I can't even imagine that was an attractive name for a woman back then, right? I mean, it's just, that's some weird names, but come on. Uh, so they have three kids together and then she leaves him. She winds up living with another man. Um, 
Probably not much of a surprise there. Their first child is a son, and God tells them, name him Jezreel. Doesn't mean a lot to us. Uh, it means God sows. And so at kind of first glance, right, we're like, oh, that's cool. You know, God's planting something that symbolizes new life. It's the springtime. We know what. Everybody's got your tomato plants going. Well, a couple of you, apparently. It's not everybody. And I can see why you're thinking that, but that's not what's being implied. Instead, what's meant is God sows. And how would, how would a, a farmer sow? He, he would scatter the seed. There's a scattering that's taking place. This is a prophetic judgment on the people of God. So God's like, I want you to marry an adulteress. And then I want you to name that first one Jezreel. It doesn't stop there. Um, Actually, it had a double meaning. Let's go back to Jezreel. Uh, This is where Israel's King Jehu slaughtered Judah's king, I know lots of names, uh, Ahaziah, and 42 of his relatives. So this was an atrocity in their eyes. There's not a single person back then that, like, this is my kid Jezreel. They'd be like, awesome name. They'd be like, what were you thinking? Like, why would you name your kid that? And I was trying to think of something. It'd be kind of like, kind of like, and again, some of you are too young. You'll have to, you'll have to Google it. But it'd be kind of like us naming a kid Columbine. It's dark. It, it's, it symbolizes death. It, it's something horrific. We wouldn't do that. Their second child was a girl, and God told them, name her Lo Ruhama, which means, you ready for this? She is not loved. <laughs> That's not going to look good on any painting in the kid's nursery, right? It's just not, she is not loved. We just want to be, no. People pick some weird names nowadays. I don't know what kind of insanity some of you have gotten yourselves wrapped up in by naming your kids all kind of weird names that are super hard to spell and your kids are going to have to explain it for the rest of their lives. And I figured out the more granola, if you eat cheeseburgers and french fries, you name your kids like normal people. But if you're super healthy, sometimes you're like, that's weird, let's do that. So anyway, I've defended half of you, I know. (laughs) Some of you are like, I think Lo Ruha Mom, I'm going to go with that. (laughs) Well, don't. It means she's not loved. It's terrible. (laughs) I probably, some of y'all are going to be sending me bags of granola now. It's just, <laughs> that's fine. I'll put it on ice cream. It's fine. Um, <laughs> Lo Hurama. Uh, she's not loved and it can also be translated no mercy. These are judgment names. God tells Hosea, I want you to marry an adulterous woman. The woman leaves him for another man. They've got these three kids. And he says, I want you to name them. I'm going to scatter you. And there is no mercy for you. And after she weaned, she is not loved. They had a second son. In his name, God told them to name him Lo Ami, which means not my people. So I don't know if you're picking up on, can you imagine introducing these kids? Like you're walking into a social situation. Somebody's like, hey there, young man, what's your name? Jezreel. God's going to scatter our people. Oh, that's interesting. Well, how about you, pretty girl? What's your name? I'm not loved. Huh. How about you, little guy? What's your name, buddy? Not my people. I mean, I don't know if you're picking up on it, but it, judging by the names, it seems like God, everybody pay attention, is finished with these people. They've rebelled one too many times. They pushed away one too many times. They've said one too many times, I know what God said, but. And I just have to believe with this many people in the room and joining us online that there's somebody listening to this message today. And I know this is a heavy kind of message. I just have to believe there's somebody that's in the midst of an addiction, in the midst of an affair, in the midst of stealing money from your company, in in the midst of being a terrible person to other people, to being an abusive parent, to being a kid that abuses your parents, grace and mercy toward you. Like, I I don't know. I, I just have to believe that there's somebody in here that when we start talking about these sin cycles, that there's a part of you that wonders, has God gotten to the end with me? It sounds to me like he's done with them. He says in Hosea 11:2, 2, the more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals, the other gods, and burning offerings to 
to idols, generation after generation after generation. Uh, God had called them back to himself over and over and over again, and yet they continued to walk away. And as you read through the book, book of Hosea, again, it sounds like he is done with them. Hosea 5, 6, with their flocks and herds, they shall go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him because he has withdrawn from them. Hosea 9, 15 says, because of the wickedness of their deeds, I will drive them out of my house and I will love them no more. The counselors call this breakup language and they will tell you, don't use this kind of language unless you mean it. And if you're hearing this prophecy um, from Hosea, you would have to be thinking, if you were one of these people, God has come to the end with me. God is, is finished delivering me. God is finished redeeming me. God is finished putting my feet back on solid ground. He must be really finished with me. Can you imagine the sinking feeling that must have taken place in their souls? And my question for us today, I, I just want us to be honest with ourselves. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to do any of those kinds of things in this moment. I, I just want you to be honest with yourself. Do you wonder and do you think that you've pushed God away one too many times? Because you know there's been other people in your life that you, you, push, too, you push too hard. You, you mouthed off one time too many uh, to a boss and eventually said you're toxic for the company and he cut you loose. I know everybody else thinks you just got laid off, but it, you know what happened. Maybe you've offended your spouse in whatever way you've offended your spouse one too many times. And they, they said, that's, that's it. I, I, I'm finished. I'm done. And, and so you know that feeling of being pushed away. Maybe as a parent, you've, you've got this kid that's been in, in a season of rebellion and you've needed to create some boundaries, but you saw the look on their face whenever you told them, I, we cannot and we will not, we don't think it's best for you. And by the way, to the kid that maybe is rebelling, your parents probably need to do this. But, but the, the parent, you saw the look, you saw the look when you told them, right? And that feeling and the kid, or the, the, maybe you're an adult that you're doing this to your parents, whatever, like don't get hung up in the semantics. Like whenever you heard that and you knew that there were gonna be boundaries and that there was this kind of, this pushing away, that, what did you feel in that moment? Because that is what they felt. And I just wonder who in here based just on your own sin and your own rebellion wonders if maybe God is finished with you. He's still going, Hosea eleven seventy. He said, my people are bent on turning away from me and though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. Such a lonely, broken place to be. But then, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there's this big turn in God's posture. And, and we, do, we need to be sure that we focus on this because some of you are going, man, sound, it sounds like based on those things, you guys named this thing the wrong thing. It shouldn't be called never too far gone because apparently we can get too far gone, right? That's, that's what it sounds like. And up until this point, it's been a bunch of breakup language, but then listen to what God says in Hosea 11, eight and nine. He said, how can I give up on you, Ephraim? And remember, that's another word for Israel. How, how can I hand you over? I want you to feel and sense and, and see that this is the compassionate heart of God, who has said time and again, whenever I am in a relationship with you, it, it's, it's like a, a relationship between husband and wife, which is supposed to be the most intimate, connected relationship that can exist between human beings. And God is saying, that's the relationship. Like, I want us to share everything. I want you to know me, and I want you to know that I know you. I want you to know that I'm running interference for you. I've got you covered top, bottom, left, right, front, and back. Like, I want you to know that because I love you. You And so you have all of this judgment and then you have this, this, this heart that just shows up that says, how can I make you like Adma, which is a city that was destroyed with Sodom and Gomorrah? How can I treat you like Zeboim? How, my heart recoils within me, my compassion. 
He's telling them, like, I, I've got compassion for you, and it grows warm and tender, and I will not execute my burning anger, and I will not again destroy Ephraim, uh, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. What is he saying? God is saying to his people, you have turned away from me. You have rejected me. You have ignored me. You have said, I know what you said, but, and I still have mercy to give you. I can't bring myself, this is essentially what he's saying, to give you what you deserve for your sins. He's saying, I haven't given up on you. Now, I wanna pause here for just a second because there's somebody, I promise you, that's in this room or watching online uh, that doesn't believe that. And so I'm going to take us into a brief testimony time. I don't want this to be weird, and I don't, no one's getting the mic if you're going, oh, this is my chance. It's not what's happening here. <laughs> but I just wonder, for the benefit of the person who is secretly doubting, if there's anyone in here who would be willing to testify that when you thought there was no hope for you, the mercy of God showed up at just the right time. And if you can testify to that, would you do it by a shout of praise and a clap of hand? If that's you, would you give them some encouragement to know? <laughs> to the person who doubts and wonders, you don't have to just take my word for it. This entire room is just kind of sprinkled with people who will tell you that they thought they were too far gone at one point. But the mercy of God saved them. So going back to the metaphor of Hosea and Gomer's marriage, they had three kids together, then Gomer left him. She was living with another man. Punishment for adultery was to be stoned to death. Hosea 3, God tells Hosea, and I'll paraphrase this as well, but he says, go find her. And I'm guessing at this point, Jose is like, okay, yeah, I'll find her because I know what's supposed to happen to her. And then he said this, instead of stoning her to death, like she deserves. So God's not like sweeping anything under the rug. He's like, she deserves it. You're right, she deserves it. But instead of stoning her to death, like she deserves under the law, Jose, here's what I want you to do. I want you to purchase her back. He's like, with my money, she's, yeah. God's like, yeah, with your money. With 15 shekels of silver. And then, everybody look at me. He said, take her home and love her again. Now, if I'm Hosea, I'm like, first of all, you told me to marry an adulterous woman. Check. Then you sent me someone named Gomer, which did not look good on the invitations. But check. And... I, if there's a lady in here today named Gomer, <laughs> I am so sorry. I didn't even think about that maybe a thing, but I bet you don't go by it. That's what I would say. But <laughs> I just made it worse, didn't I? So anyway, I got all the healthy people mad at me and Gomer, so I am so sorry. Don't you know if you're Jose, you're like, really, God? You ex... She left me. Do you not know what she put our kids through? Have you not been paying attention to what's happening here? And you're telling me that I'm supposed to go find her. Do you know how humiliating that's gonna be for me to go find her? And then you want, like you want me to take my hard earned money and purchase her back? You don't, like why is she getting by it? Why, why, why is she not subject to the same law everyone else is subject to? And that's how we think. But praise God uh, of all creation. <laughs> like, praise God that he doesn't think the way we think. Um, because Gomer didn't just represent Israel. Gomer represents us. You see, this whole time God's been telling a story that you and I need to hear. Every single one of us has turned our back on God and gone our own way. Uh, and he came chasing after us. 
Uh, we didn't come to our senses and come crawling back to God, pleading for mercy. He came to us. And while we were still sinners, the Bible says that he died for us so that we might be able um, to live in righteousness. It says he died for the ungodly. That was us. And the father is the one who paid the price for our freedom. And he didn't just pay 15 shekels of silver. He put himself on a cross and died the most excruciating death so that the wrath of God that you and I deserve would be placed on him so that you and I could avoid the wrath of God. He paid for all of that for us. That's the picture that's being painted in the text. And God didn't want us to miss this. He wanted us to know even in our rebellion that there is an opportunity to come back home, to come back to the Father, to be part of the family. Second Timothy 2.13, beautiful passage of scripture. He says this, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. It's on him. He's the one doing all of the heavy lifting. And, and, and I, I get that, that there may be some like, I don't even know how this works and how does this whole, t-? listen, let's go to the vow renewals. Remember, because God's in this marriage thing. And he's given all of this judgment and all this kind of condemnation. He's like, you know what? You have, you, you have turned your hearts to me, like away from me, and you've been rebellious to me. And, and then he says, but I don't, want, I, I don't want to bring this judgment on you. Like I, I want to redeem you. And listen to the vow renewals in Hosea 2, 14 through 23. And, and look at who's doing all of the work here. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. He didn't say condemn her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Acre a door of not condemnation, but a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time whenever she came out of the land of Egypt. And in that day declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. There's that language again. And no longer will you call me my Baal. He's saying, I want a relationship with you. I I want you to know that I'm in this with you. 17, for I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I, here he's doing the work, will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the creeping things around. He's doing the work. I will abolish the law or, or the bow and the sword, and the war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety, and I will betroth you to me forever, and I will betroth you to me in righteousness, and in justice, and steadfast love, and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord, and in that day I will answer, declares the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth, and the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil, and they shall answer, uh uh-oh, here are these names, Jezreel. But look what God does. And I will sow her for myself in the land. And I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. Everybody look, um, God was not finished with Israel. And I just believe there's somebody in here today who needs to hear, he is not finished with you either. Yeah, but my sin, listen, there's a story in the New Testament. I'm gonna have to go really quickly on this, but uh, there's a story in the New Testament often referred to as the prodigal son. The story goes that there was this dad, he had two boys. One of the boys came to the dad and said, I want my inheritance early. This is one of the worst things that you could have done back in in this culture, this first century Jewish culture. Everything was about the father's name and and he didn't do anything to bring humiliation or embarrassment to the father. And whenever this kid asked for the inheritance, it was humiliating the father. And whenever the kid got the inheritance and left, everybody in society would have told the father, that son needs to be dead to you. And if he ever comes back home, you need to have him killed on the spot. He's no longer part of your family. He has humiliated you. The story goes that the kid left and he squandered all of his money. He found himself eating pig slop. And as a first century Jewish boy, you didn't get around pigs, but this one did because he didn't have any other choice. The Bible says whenever he came to his senses, he thought, I need to go back to my dad and I need to see if my dad can 
I don't know, let me become one of his servants because even my dad's servants, my dad's a good guy. That's what the text tells us. The kid knew that his dad was a good man. He's like, if I, I just gotta get back to my dad and my dad will be able to help me. And so he put together this speech. There's a lot of speech writers in here whenever you're getting ready to take something to God. He practiced this speech and he mustered the courage to be able to go back to his father's house. And the text tells us that as he was walking toward the father's house, the dad was outside and he saw his son coming from a long distance. Now, Jewish men in those days would have worn robes and they never would have run. Not a dignified man wouldn't run. And they would wear the robes because it was absolutely forbidden that a noble man would ever show his legs. But the text tells us that whenever the dad saw the son coming from a long distance away, he took off running. Well, there's only one way that a dad wearing a robe could actually run, and that was to lift the robe. And I think one of the most beautiful pictures that, that I've ever like, been exposed to in the scripture is that while this kid who had humiliated his father and should have been put to death uh, what had turned his heart toward the father, the father saw that and he lifted his robe. And as he started to run, all of the onlookers who had their shame pinned on the son immediately shifted the shame to the father. And I wanna say to the person sitting in this room and watching online that feels so shamed and so smothered by condemnation. According to the text, you're not too far gone. And if you will turn in repentance to the Father, what you're gonna realize is that he has been pursuing you the whole time. And the cross that Jesus went to shifted the shame that it was on you onto him so that you and I could be forgiven. We're gonna sing a song. I want you to have freedom in this, this time. Don't, don't leave, the kids are fine, parking lot's fine. Some of you may need to come up here and pray, use this as an altar and you're like, I don't know if I can get out of the row. Look at the people in the row and just tell them to move. They'll move and you can come up, like whatever you need to do. If you need to stand, sit, if you need to get some people around you, huddle up and pray. If you need to pray by yourself, whatever it is you need to do, can we just in this series, declaring if we know it's true and receiving it if we've doubted it, that because of God's mercy, we're never too far gone. God, would you help us to believe that and live that, celebrate that, receive that today in Jesus' name, amen.